Welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv in San Diego, California. And today's episode is brought to you by the world's first creatine coffee, which is only fitting because I designed this product based off an interview I heard with today's guest, Dr. Andy Galpin, on the Barbell Shrugged podcast years ago. So we've really come full circle here, and I had a really good time at Cal State Fullerton talking with Dr. Andy Galpin, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. All right, thanks, guys. saw too or not but brian mckenzie you know brian mckenzie i do yeah so he and i just wrote a book okay that just came out too oh you did so it's just just came up on that. amazon uh and it'll be pre-orders are up now and it'll be out july 11 okay uh so that's called uh unplugged evolving from technology uh-huh. to enhance your consciousness fitness and performance evolving from technology from technology which means what? So what that really is is a guide for competitive weightlifters all the way to the normal wearable people, mm-hmm. so fit bidders, et cetera, yep. all the way to the entrepreneur to how technology can lead you awry mm-hmm. and then how more to how to identify that if it is, yep. and then more importantly, how to fix that. So it's a, it's a solution-based book, which is not just like, all right, ditch, ditch technology, go live in the woods, like, throw away your bed, you know, your mattress, yeah, yeah. like that, that doesn't work. Right. But it's a more appropriate use of technology, wearables, how it can cause problems, identify if that's happening to you. Yep. And then what easy, manageable, realistic solutions can you take to have a more appropriate relationship with technology? Right, right. So what's interesting about that is I'm, uh, right now I'm like in the process of my first uh, round of editing in a book mm. that I've been writing for a while. And, uh, the the concept of it is that like we're in a, a point in our life right now where technology has advanced so much, uh, like the com- the technology in comfort, the technology in food, mm-hmm. and our biology basically cannot keep up at the pace no. that technology is at. So I think the key is trying to find a healthy relationship between utilizing these things to make your life easier, mm-hmm. right? Because that's what capitalism is, does. Um, and, and you, as it should. Right. And any entrepreneur knows like you are filling a gap, right? A need in the market. But the problem is as a consumer, if you do nothing but gobble all of these things up, you're going to end up, uh, well, with the top three killers of Americans right now. Yeah. And that's exactly all that stuff was covered. That's exactly what we go after in our book. So you're too late. Nice. Nice. You're gonna have Actually, to come, I think I am too late. You're going to have like to come five books spin. on this yeah. since I started writing it. Yeah. So where ours is a little bit different too is that we include uh, very specific training and physical activity and exercise stuff too. Oh, okay. So it includes not only like lifestyle, like, you know, checking your email, not all the time, getting off your phone stuff, but it yeah. includes... Uh, being exposed to cold, being exposed to hunger, what you should do for thirst, how you should train or not, endurance, strength mm-hmm. work, all this stuff. So it's all combined into one. So it's everything from the wearable Fitbit to how to appropriately use some software like Dartfish or Coach's Eye for oh, exercise techniques. Those? So those are little apps you can get on your phone or your iPad okay. where you can video, say, an athlete running or jumping or doing a pull-up and then instantaneously pull it back up, and then you can mark it for joint angle and say, say, hey, like this is what I mean when I say your back is bending at the top or whatever, mm-hmm. and then you can show it to them immediately. So these are actually like very high-powered biomechanical diagnostic software that's $3 on a phone app. Okay. Something like that. All the way down to as simple as should you use a mirror or not. When you lift. All these things, yeah. And so, you? Well, these, the book is really when you should use it and when you should not use it. Okay. Because it's not a blanket answer, right? right. There are clearly some benefits. And anyone that's ever coached knows that if, if you can show an athlete and they can see the movement, they immediately are going to learn a lot faster. Right, right. But that also has inherent problems and limitations to it. If, for example, you have to have a mirror to run correctly, you don't really own that movement. Right. And so that if you extend that all the way to HRV, to blood work, mm-hmm. to... Uh, a tech savvy shoe to nootropics mm-hmm. uh, there are of course clear benefits to these and yeah. you should have a more appropriate understanding of them so that you don't fall into the traps which is what happens almost all the time right now right and if you uh, clean and jerk in a mirror you will knock yourself out 
Yeah, or you'll miss a lot. <laughs> right, right. Right. So there are some times when you should use it, and right. it'd be helpful, but there are other times when that one in particular is a very easy physiological explanation. The fact that the movement velocity in a jerk yep. is much faster than the recognition of your eye into your conscious thought mm -hmm. and do motor control and action, which is a very fancy way of saying, if you see, for example, oh my gosh, my left arm is a little behind, mm -hmm. it's too late. Because by the time you see that, recognize that, and then try right. to make a thing, the position's already moved. You're done with the movement. So it would be useless and often counterintuitive because then you make an adjustment that you're behind on. Right. And so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems like probably why they spend so much time drilling technique because that, that needs to be ingrained and it can't be a conscious thought when you try it's to It's too do late. It. Yep, exactly. So, so, so we, need to, we need to move for a more, with, to a more appropriate relationship with that technology so that we understand when is it being useful for teaching and then when do I need to actually embed that in as a motor control unit. Right, right. So uh, in your book, Unplugged, mm -hmm. when you talk about recommending movement patterns, recommending strength programs or endurance programs, mm -hmm. uh, what are you recommending them for? Is this optimal performance? Is this So we actually outline longevity? for all that. Okay. And so we have a system for what are you? Who are you? Mm -hmm. Are you just trying to be as healthy and fit as possible because you love movement and want to be around and you're like, well, okay, there's, there's a set of guidelines and rubrics for those people. Are you trying to compete in world championships this summer? Well, mm -hmm. then th those are different relationships. Right. And so the book, what we uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out is putting a system together so that it's scaffolding, really. So what are you? Okay, then follow this scaffolding. It's an algorithm, if okay. you will. Right. Uh, and so hopefully, if we've done it well, it will apply to everyone, whether you're that person or more appropriately, or, or maybe more importantly, if you're going, okay, like, I don't exercise, I never have, mm -hmm. I got a full-time job, I honestly just want to know how to be a little bit healthier, I thought I was doing the right thing, I bought the wearable, it was 400 bucks, like, damn it, Right. how the hell do I... So we have a section for that, too. So it's like, hey, if you are just a beginner, just trying to get started on this stuff, Here's what we recommend. Here's what we don't recommend. So you help people that uh, that may, might not have a background in this thing kind of digest all of that information and figure out how to use it. Yeah, because in that particular case, it's very easy. It's information overload. Right. And more importantly, it is information. So there's a difference between data is not knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And knowledge is not understanding. Keep in mind, my feeble mind is going to be <laughs> no, trying right. to keep up with all of these. That's why I paused. Yeah. So data is not knowledge. No. So I could hand you a spreadsheet from your Fitbit that could have thousands of sheets of data. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you know anything. Right. You can't conceptualize that. I don't know what the numbers. hell that means. Okay. And then, because I don't know what the hell that means, or if I do know what that means, that doesn't mean I understand what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And so there are multiple layers to these things. And one of the problems that the beginners have, or I shouldn't say beginners because that sounds pejorative and I don't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. But... People that are just like, wow, I don't, I don't have the time or I don't really care. Like, I'm just trying to do the right thing, man. Like, right, somebody right. help me. Yep. A lot of that data is useless. Yep. And so what you can use it for in that particular case maybe is some basic rudimentary calibration. Now, it might be wrong by 10%, 20%, but, for example, if you took the average person, mm -hmm. you walked outside of this building and you went to the next one, the engineering building that you're at, right? And yep. you just said, hey, how many calories do you eat in a day? you'd probably get a lot of like, um, maybe like 2,000. Yeah. yeah like right, everyone's right, going right. to say that, right? Right, right. <laughs> like what? Some of you were at 800. Some of you were 7,000. Yeah. And then if you grabbed them a plate, just went to the cafeteria, grabbed them a plate of food, yeah. and handed it to them and said, how, how many grams of protein are in that? Mm -hmm. How many calories? No one would even get remotely close, right? right? You'd be magnitudes of order, digits off. Yep. And so something like maybe an app for your phone that can scan your food plate and tell you the cake house even though that's very, very inaccurate, mm -hmm. it's probably a lot more accurate than most people's eyeball. Sure. These people, right? Yep. And so if you said, oh my God, I thought I was eating like, you know, 100 grams of protein a day. Turns out I'm usually at around 12. Yeah. Then that's a pretty good calibration tool for you to go, oh, okay, like I'm understanding basically. That's not going to help a world champion lose that last 3% of body fat. Mm -hmm. You need way more technology than that. You need way more experience. You need way more detail. You need more individual data as well. For right? sure, right? You're going to have to track yourself over time, self-experiment, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But for the, the very novice person in that field, it's, a, it's very good to get you a rough calibration of thing. Um, I just had this, somebody asked me this question on Twitter this morning. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, some of the people come are coming out right now saying that uh, maybe we need to up the 10,000 step a day. Okay. That's the normal prescription for physical health, right? Right, right. You get a Fitbit, it's like it'll right. go off at 10,000. Exactly. The whole goal, and, and those are our governmental guidelines, yep. 10K steps a day. Yeah. We maybe need to increase that to 15K. And the real rationale and, and what they're not saying, or at least, at least the way that I like to think about it is, there's a very significant difference between physical activity mm -hmm. and exercise. And so the pitfall people like me fell into, for sure, was, man, I squat five days a week, I train super hard, I'm plenty active, I'm healthy. Yep. But then you sit for the other 23 hours of the day. Right, right. Or the other 23 hours and 15 minutes or whatever it is, right? Yep. And so one of the things we could to realize is those people aren't necessarily healthy either. Mm -hmm. But the people who walk 10,000 steps a day but never do anything vigorous or intense or difficult or hard, they're not healthy either. Mm -hmm. And so if we really want to optimize health for the more normal person, we need to have a combination of a lot of physical activity Yep. because what we're really doing is making up for 200,000 years of evolution that had this basal physical activity of probably more like 30 or 40 or 50,000 steps a day. Mm -hmm. And now we have, in a span of half of a generation, almost completely eliminated all of that. Right. So now all we're doing with the 10K steps is putting you back to a bare minimum to not die super fast. Right, right. And then you need to exercise to replace all the physical work we used to do. Mm -hmm. And so really, either we need to move the guidelines up to 15K minimum a day, or we need to realize that, no, 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 10K is the bare minimum of just movement. Right. That doesn't count your hard training. You still need to do something heavy. Mm -hmm. Heart rate needs to go up. You need to do a bunch of different positions, be well-rounded, and that will just keep you from not dying. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make you healthy, though. Right. So acknowledging there's a difference between training, what's what's fit and what's healthy, or, or being adapted to a training regimen and, and being healthy are different. Totally. At the same time, though, when you become adapted to a training regimen, like let's say CrossFit or Olympic weightlifting or something, typically you are increasing those factors that are going to help with longevity, like hip to weight ratio or hip Some to of waist them. ratio. I mean, yeah. Right. Some of them. But you have to realize if you really want to optimize health, uh -huh. if you spend five years optimizing your squat strength, you probably lost health. Right. right. Even though st even though leg strength is a very, 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 very important for health, one of the single highest predictors. Right. That does not improve overall health that much because overall health is a composite of multiple things. Mm -hmm. Strength being one of those very important wheels. Okay. But if, for example, if you try to drive your car with one badass tire, right. you ain't going very far. Right, right. So you, we have to we have to really think like I, I get this uh, fairly often. I, I had a post recently on Instagram because a new paper came out showing grip strength mm -hmm. was a very strong significant predictor of mortality. Yep, everyone's great. Told you I'm healthy, right? I do all these farmers carries great. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I took my grad class last night into the the lab into the uh, the weight room, and we have a treadmill, and I said put it at 15 degrees, put it at six miles an hour. Okay and see how long you can run. And a lot of these people are competitive powerlifters, weightlifters, national caliber folks. Okay, so they're running a 10 minute mile. They're not making a minute. Wait, what? 15 degree yep. incline, six miles an hour. Okay. And they're making it like a minute, a minute five, a minute 10 seconds. Really? Yeah. Maybe I'm not able to conceptualize how hard this is. It doesn't feel It's hard. not that hard. Right, okay. I mean, it's hard. Right. If you put it this way, like uh, three, four minutes is, yep. is a decent score. Okay. Okay, like okay. on that, maybe maybe more for like the average person. Somebody's super fit. Maybe okay. some of your listeners are like, <laughs> right, right. I'm crushing seven, eight minutes. That's totally yeah. probably possible. Uh, but for your average person, okay, like these are not good scores. Yep. And I did that to highlight this exact argument, which I'm saying like, yeah, you are optimizing your strength, mm -hmm. and that is important for longevity, but you are in the tanks with your fitness. Mm -hmm. You have no conditioning. You have no ability to produce sustained energy. And if we think about this, we are, again, from a species that should be able to move for hours a day consecutively. Mm -hmm. If you can't jog, uh, uh, just a, like a light jog, five yeah. miles, right. you're not fit. Right. As a, again, that, that's not saying like, oh, I'm competing in world championships and weightlifting in two weeks. Well, don't go jog for five. Like you should, yeah. That's not. Right, right. But if you're training for health, 
This is a hole. This is a big, big problem. You need to have some ability to sustain. I say you should be able to produce movement for an hour straight. Right. I mean, that could be, I'm not talking sprinting or jogging. I'm right. not even saying running. But if you can't cycle light. Like aerobic pace. Rower, whatever it happens mm-hmm. to be, right? Heart rate of 130. I mean, I'm talking low, but, but if you can't do that for an hour without dying mm-hmm. or needing three days off, that's a problem. If you can't squat a decent load, that's a problem too. Mm-hmm. If you can't do high intensity anaerobic anaer- anaerobic intervals, mm-hmm. that's a problem too. And so, if we're looking at health, we have to look at and say, what are all the the pieces of information that have been shown to be significant predictors of mortality? Yeah. Okay. There's been a bunch in a different bunch of different areas. Yep. Then, if we really want to increase increase mortality, we need to be as well rounded in all of them. Mm-hmm. We can't selectively pick the one that feels good. Right. It's right. not a justification to be like, "Told you, bro. All you need to do is lift." Probably not. Right. And do you think that when you look at cardiovascular health versus uh, maximal strength versus muscular endurance, is there uh, one that I mean, people are going to point to the argument of like, I just don't have time to be a, a CrossFit Games athlete? Fair enough. Right. Yeah. Is there one that people should focus on more than other, do you think, no. for longevity? Nope. Not at all? Nope. No way. It would be really, really difficult. If you had to bias towards one, mm-hmm. I would probably say VO2 max. That would be the one that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. But somebody with a very high VO2 max who is very, very weak is in a problem too. Mm -hmm. If you had to pick one, world record VO2 max or world record strength, and if longevity was your only concern, the world VO2 max is not even going to be close. Right, right. Right. Um, Because there's a, you have far exceeded the necessary strength to survive Mm -hmm. if you're squatting a thousand pounds. Yep. But having a VO2 max of 70, 75, 80, um, that's probably going to continually increase longevity outside of the training that required you to get to that high of a VO2 max probably broke you mm-hmm. if you're not doing it well. Yeah. But that all aside, if you had to pick one, but the better answer is it, we are not a species that does one thing mm-hmm. and we're not supposed to. So right, right. even coming up with that question, I know it was just a, a thought game yeah, yeah. question, but if you're realistically thinking that, yeah. um, that that's a bad position to be in. Yeah, and I don't think uh, I'm necessarily realistically thinking it, but I think that sure. a ton of people, they'll start, at least I've seen this evolution, they start with CrossFit, and they love it, and mm-hmm. then they're like, Olympic weightlifting is way more fun, yep. and then it becomes really cool to say, that lifting weights faster is my cardio, and then yep. it, the next part of that evolution is, is my one rep max is the only thing that matters, right? And then people, now it's like really cool to shit on cardio altogether. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm just thinking for people in that No, position. you're right. Yeah. I'm with you entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I can speak that because I was definitely like that. Mm-hmm. When I was competing in weightlifting, Yeah, like that, that's, that was my approach too, right, right? right? But you're really not thinking about longevity when you're 24. Right. I mean, you might say you are, but you're really, really not. Yeah. And you don't really start to understand that. You don't start to feel that yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not even when you're 30 or 35. Like th- these things really haven't kicked in. But when you're 45, probably. Yeah. Now you're starting to see like, wow, okay, uh, you know, this light jog around the block, I'm gassed. Yep. Maybe 15 years of only worrying only about my snatch velocity probably wasn't the right choice. Yeah. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this is something I've noticed within my own training because I've kind of gone back and forth between ultra running and weightlifting, which is a ridiculous back and forth. But uh, something I've noticed is, you know, even if your number one concern is maximal strength, having a baseline aerobic yes. capacity is going to make you a much better lifter. Yep. Now, where people fight back on that one, because you're totally right, uh-huh. is a fundamental misunderstanding of what aerobic capacity means. Okay. You don't, if you're trying to maximize whatever, you want to you pick it, CrossFit, weightlifting, powerlifting, strongman, doesn't yep. matter. Yep. You need a very good aerobic base. Now, as you shift from weightlifting and powerlifting to strongman, and then you shift from there to CrossFit, you're moving from less anaerobic need to more, sorry, less aerobic need mm-hmm. to more aerobic need, right? Okay. So there's a difference between all those, of, like, clearly. Mm-hmm. But the fundamental misunderstanding is you don't need to be able to run for 15 miles to have an aerobic base. Right. That, that's not at all what we're saying. And mm-hmm. so that's, I feel like generally this conversation is people talking past each other. Yep. Because they're like, these guys are idiots. You don't need to be able to run. Who said I have to run for... Right, right. That's not what we're saying. I don't care if you never run. You don't need to run two steps in your life. Pick whatever you want, but you need to be able to produce sustained energy for whatever you want to call it, 20 minutes, 40, I don't know, rower, swim, Mm -hmm. circuit, do a light circuit, do 
um, push a prowler, drag a sled. Well, it yep. doesn't have to be anything. A friend of mine, Cal Dietz at Minnesota, strength coach, he does this little circuit where he does 50% of your back squat, okay, 50% of your bench, and you just go back and forth one rep at a time. One rep bench, one rep squat. Yep. And you do that for 30 straight minutes. And when you're a 330-pound, six-foot-eight offensive lineman at the University of Minnesota, yeah, that's cardio. Right, right. For sure. Right. Like, they get a great workout. They lose. He uses that primarily as their fat loss training if they need to lose a bunch of weight. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because he's like, I can't take these guys and have them go. They're not going to go jog. Right, right. That's going to be a problem. Right. Most people don't jog well, don't run well mm-hmm. at all. So yep. even if you're not 330 pounds but you're, you know, 180 and you're or 210 and you're 20, 30 pounds overweight and you don't yeah. run well – you're probably going to break too. So if you don't run well, fine. Pick a, pick a, whatever you want, but you need to have all of that can develop your aerobic base. I'm sorry, but a set of 10 squats mm-hmm. is not going to build your aerobic base weightlifter. Right, right. Like, and again, I say that because I am one of you. Right, like, right. This, this, I, 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 we, I, make, I still make the same joke in my class. Like, what do weightlifters call a set of three reps? Uh-huh. Cardio. Right. I make the same jokes. I'm, I'm on your team, but I'm, I'm telling you because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sympathetic or empathetic with you and support. I'm saying... Even if you are a competitive powerlifter, weightlifter, whatever you want to be, mm-hmm. there needs to be a, at least some conditioning in your approach. And a set of 10 or 12 is not, that is a part of conditioning you need. Yeah. But there are all the other things as well. And I'm also not saying that you're, again, four weeks out from American Open. Like, don't start a new sled pushing conditioning routine. But if all you've done is compete all year, mm-hmm. And you get out of American Open, and then you decide, okay, now I got to get ready for University Nationals, or whatever the order is. Now they've also they're also around. Okay, and then I had six weeks to compete for this, and then I got six weeks to do this. And all year, all you're doing is trying to optimize your strength. Mm-hmm. You're probably not. Gonna, it's probably not going to work. Right. So there needs to be a an off season where we say, look, I'm going to step back. I'm going to spend a month or five weeks or whatever it is, building back my fitness base. Mm-hmm. Through high quality movements, yep. ones that are more transferable, fixing other issues I have, movement patterns, strength weaknesses, and then I'll come back to optimizing my strength. But that is where most people fail is not having that reset button. And the same is true for the ultra runner community, mm-hmm. right? You see that in the endurance community too. It's like, well, I'm just going from competition to competition to competition to competition right. to race to race to race. Yep. It's like, well, when have we stepped back and in that case, built my strength base? Right. Or built my movement base, or whatever yeah. your issue is. Yeah, yeah, and I, I actually definitely want to get into that. The on the on the weightlifting side, my theory is, and you can just shoot holes in this left and right, I'm sure. But my theory is that you're as a as a weightlifter, right? You want to spend as much time under maximal uh, load as possible to get stronger. Yeah. And when you you want to be able to sustain a longer training session, even if your rep count's not high. Yep. So if you're like thirty or forty minutes into a training session, if your capacity to move is better because you have that aerobic Mm -hmm. uh, baseline, you're going to be able to generate more velocity and power deeper into your training session. Very likely. Without it. Yeah, it's very likely. Okay. I mean, again, there's details here that, and there's different scenarios that aren't true and there's individual people you could, but, but as a very general statement, that's very true. Right, right. I'd agree. So moving into the endurance side then for people that are on the opposite side of the spectrum, Mm -hmm. the ultra runners, the triathletes, what is your opinion on strength training for them and then also on uh, frequency of training? So strength training, it's, it's a no-brainer mm-hmm. uh, because you're going to get all of the aerobic base you could ever imagine in your extensive mileage. Right. All right. Other than on your bike and the pool running. It doesn't yep. matter. Uh, so strength training is important. Now, in terms of the frequency of the strength training, it depends on what cycle you're in in terms of your season. Mm-hmm. Your competition cycle. Right. Right. Probably what you're honestly looking at is two times a week, I would Mm -hmm. imagine. If you could sneak a third in, great. But it's really difficult because strength training uh, for an ultra runner is very different than strength training for a weightlifter. Right. Right. You're not going to hit the volume. We see this all the time where somebody who has worked in weightlifting or even collegiate strength conditioning and they work with a distance athlete and they go, okay, and they start throwing together volumes that they would throw at a weightlifter. Yeah. And you're like... Uh, he's already at 85 miles a week on the bike. Right. Uh, he's, you know, whatever. And you start throwing up the yep. numbers and you're like, he can't do 12 sets of three of this and then, and then nine sets of two of this. Like, you're going to smash this guy or girl. Right. And so the frequency can be fairly high in the weight room for these endurance folks if mm-hmm. you keep the volume very, very, very low. So one or two or three exercises. Okay. Two or three sets of one or two or three or four reps. Yep. And then stop. Mm-hmm. 
really good quality. You know, obviously you warm up to those heavyweights, right? Yep. Good movement. And then you shut it down, especially if it's their first time in the weight room or they're used to doing like one lifting session a week. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you go to two sessions a week. Well, now you've doubled their lifting volume. Right. Did you cut their, their running and their, and their swimming down? If you didn't, then you've just doubled their volume in that modality, which is a real problem. You have got to give their tendons and ligaments and joints a long time to go, okay, like, we didn't account for this. Yeah. So the frequency, I mean, if I just have to give you an answer, I'd probably say two weeks, realist- two times a week, realistically. Yeah, right, right. Because it's hard to get endurance athletes off the pavement and it off is, the road. Yeah. Well, and the other issue is, because um, I'm in the middle of an ultra season right now, is like, mm. On Wednesday night, if I'm going to do, um, let's say I'm going to run on Wednesday night, I'm running until 8 o'clock at yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. So, like, it's, you know, just finding the time from a sheer, you know, that that's a difficult Well, time. that's the other thing. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good point where, unlike with weightlifter or powerlifter or even a crossfitter, mm. there's one thing that an endurance athlete can't sneak away from. That's time. Yeah. Like, I, I just, I have to have an hour and a half to run because I have to run 15 miles today or, or 7 yeah. miles or whatever you're going to be today, right? Yep. You can simulate that in uh, for weightlifters. Yeah. You can sneak away with a bunch of different things. You could do multiple training sessions a day, et cetera. Mm-hmm. If you need to be able to run for two and a half hours, at some point I need two and a half straight hours to, to run. Yeah. Like you, you, you can't get away with that. And that doesn't mean every day, seven days a week, yeah. you do just straight continuous running. Yeah. I mean, I think Brian McKenzie, I loved his book, um, his Unbreakable Runner book. Mm-hmm. Because his program in there, I think, is very, very good. Like, I you should have... That. Yeah, it's solid. Yeah. I think it's, like, $11 on Amazon right now. Oh, okay. I mean, it's super, yeah, to, super cheap. Yeah. I think it's Unbreakable Runner. Okay. Unbroken or Unbreakable. I think Unbreakable. I'm, like, a half-broken runner right now. Yeah. So I need to... <laughs> but it's very good because he has he, he lays out a very nice weekly combination. Um, he takes you from your first ever 5K all the way up to your first Ultra. So wherever you're at in that spectrum, you can hop on. But he has a combination of your traditional steady state, Right, got to get on the pavement. Yeah. Yep. Um, your interval based work. So this is even for somebody who does a big distance. That might be even like repeated one mile runs. So mile as fast as you can, or at a certain pace. Yeah. Rest that time. Do it again. So you might get your five miles in today, but you're gonna break it up into five sets of one mile with breaks. That's a good way to keep a get a good tempo training session. Yeah, exactly. Right? right. So you can get a decent amount of volume. It still takes a long time though. Yep. Um, but you can do it at a higher quality okay. usually. A combination of that and your your very high intensity, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, maybe 15 rounds, mm-hmm. right? This is going to just blow your heart rate out. You're going to be shot from this with speed work in the weight room and strength in the weight room. And he has a nice combination of that in that book that says, okay, like if you really want to do your first race or improve your race performance and yeah. not get broken, uh, here's a nice template. Okay. And he can speak that much more than I can. He's worked with far more endurance runners than I have. Yeah. Do you think that you can inch the volume down if you, with correct con, uh, strength and conditioning at all? I think you can significantly reduce it. Mm-hmm. Uh, significantly. And again, I can't speak to too much of endurance running. Okay. So take that with a grain of salt. I've only worked with a few ultras in my life. But I have worked a lot with MMA fighters. Mm-hmm. And it's not even the same universe. Is that your, your population you generally work with? Uh, right now, okay. I'm working mostly with combat sport athletes, wrestlers, okay. boxers, MMA fighters. Yep. And the only parallel I can draw there is, although it's very different, their weekly training volume is almost unparalleled. Mm. It's crazy. They're legitimately having 12 to 16 full training sessions a week. Is that because of the... They're crazy and stupid. That's why. <laughs> yeah. They don't listen. Right. Uh Usually, what I, the first thing I do is cut their volume if I can in half. Okay. Literally in half. If they don't want to listen yet, we'll try to cut it by twenty five percent or more. But they're doing, you know, a very cl- they're, they're training twice a day. Yep. All, every, at least five, six days a week, uh, and then oftentimes there's three days peppered in some of those days, and those include full sparring. So they're going to go in and they're going to fight. Yeah. As hard as they can with another trained killer for 25 minutes with a one minute break in between each round. Like mm-hmm. I know that's not running, but you don't no, even that know banks you, up, though. you don't know fatigue. Right. Right. Until somebody is trying to kick you in the head and like, it, it's just, it's unreal. Yeah. No, I boxed for three or four years. Right. Just, just fist. I mean, yeah, yeah just, just have put on headgear and yep. have just body punches only. Don't let, don't punch each other in the face, put on gloves and just yep. punch each other in the stomach as hard as you can for a minute. Right. And see how exhausted you are. Right. Shocked. Right. Yep. And so with them to answer your question, we have been able to be like, we have got to get you 
the volume down because you're crushing yourself. Mm -hmm. And if we can substitute some of that with strength and conditioning work, some of them lift a lot, some of them don't lift at all. Yep. And we can get you in the weight room once to twice a week. That's generally a win mm -hmm. because we can do better quality stuff in there um, than we can on the mat. So, yeah, I, I, I would imagine the same would be true. I know yeah. Brian would agree with me too. So yeah, yeah. you can really cut the volume a lot down. Not even inch it down, you could foot it down. Some of the problem, I think, with MMA specifically is – a lot like the problem with CrossFit when I trained under OPEX for a while. Okay. And uh, I was, I, I remember I'd hit up my coach and be like, dude, I'm, I'm good, but I'm hurting. Yeah. Like um, the volume is like I'm spending six hours in the gym every day. Yeah. And his answer was like, well, you know, where you're trying to go with it, CrossFit is such an all enticing thing. There's so many disciplines. You have to be able to uh, train all of these different You think there's a lot of disciplines in CrossFit? Try to fight. Try to fight in MMA. Right, right. Like, you're learning four or five, six different sports. Yeah. Not just, like, variations of the same sport, which right. is what CrossFit is. Like, it's not well-rounded. It's always pull-ups or some variation. Yeah. It's always some sort of deadlift or variation. Mm -hmm. It's always some sort of push or variation. That's it. That's the whole sport. Like, wow, it's crazy. It's so different this year because we're using rings. Right, right. That's fucking same sport. Right, right. <laughs> Come on. Get yeah. out of here. That's true. I mean, one, look at the years that they've done the weird stuff. Like they had them throw the softball the one year, and then everyone threw a conniption fit, and that's been gone. Yeah. And then the one time they threw them in the water. Well, and they were awful at it. <laughs> Terrible, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. They have them sprint kind of sometimes. Uh huh. Uh, then they threw them in the water, but that's it. Yeah. And then they, then they threw their treadmills last year, and everyone got all mad, you know, because you're like, I thought it was functional. Now you're on a treadmill? Yeah. What happened to that? Yeah. No, but like, you're, they're right, not doing right. anything different. So when it comes to, uh, back to what we were talking about before, when it comes to general preparedness or health. Sorry, I love CrossFit for the longevity. record. Like, it's fun, but like, let's be realistic too about. Yeah, what it is. Yeah. Well, and so that was going to be my next question for a lifestyle, um, not not the sport of CrossFit, which yeah. I really Very think is different. important. Yeah, it's important to differentiate. But for for a lifestyle, what, what's your opinion on CrossFit then? Well, I mean, it's a really complex question because, you know, I had a good friend, Mike McGoldrick, mm -hmm. make it. And that was one of the, honestly, one of the happiest moments of my life because he trained and gave up a lot to make the games. That mm -hmm. was a big goal of his. And so I didn't particularly care that it was the games or if it was world championships and chess or whatever it was. Right, right. But he really gave up a ton, career, house, like all this stuff. And so Jeez. to see him reach that was yeah. one of my like happiest moments. Yeah. Like I get really emotionally just thinking about it. So I love that. And I'm sure a lot of people that's happened too. Mm -hmm. And of course you can't deny the general movement that CrossFit has done is a net positive gain. Yes. Like, th this is it's no question. Especially when it comes to fighting obesity and... All this stuff, uh, right? It is a net thing. positive gain. So yeah. the complaints I have with CrossFit are generally the their personal gripes rather than actually yeah, things yeah. that are important for you to hear. Like, they're okay. all my own petty little, like, right. I hate how they wear the stupid socks. Like, these are important <laughs> things. I hate how everyone's so culty about it. I hate how, like, they're infallible. Right. I hate how they act like they created something that they didn't. They ha they created a fantastic brand, amazing company. Like, mm -hmm. they did not create anything new exercise-wise. No. Right? They like, packaged it, though. Yeah, they packaged it well. Yeah, yeah. Like, which is awesome. I am, like, I am super impressed. I would sign up and pay if I ran a business <clears throat> to learn business strategy, development, and branding from them. Like, they crushed it. Without a doubt, yeah. Uh, they, they did a bunch of stuff that was really important based on research that we'd already published. Yeah. Like, hey, high intensity intervals are super good for health. You can lose a lot of weight this way. You can lose fat. You don't have to do this stuff. All that stuff is knowledge we and other scientists had been publishing for years. Yeah. And they, like you said, they packaged it well. So, right. like, I think that's awesome. And they built a tribe around it, which from totally. a business standpoint is the most important thing. You I mean, look do. what they did for weightlifting alone, the sport. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a dead sport. It is, we, we had 152 people at our last meet here. One before that, over 150 as well. We'll have one here in a few weeks. We'll have well over 150 again. You have them at the college here? Yeah, here. Fullerton. Okay. Down the, road, down the hallway, right? Okay. They're the biggest local meets in the country. Nice. Right? Um, when we first started, it's, it was 20 uh -huh. people, you know, 15. I competed in meets where you drive seven hours and there'd be three people there. Was that pre-CrossFit? Totally. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, nice. so you can't deny what they did for weightlifting. Right. Yeah. Which is awesome. So... Uh, the, the issue was, and my friend, um, the guy that I created the body knowledge with Kenny Kane, mm -hmm. he was one of the first CrossFit coaches. So he started CrossFit LA, which was the, I think the sixth ever CrossFit gym. Yeah. So he's been doing it for you know, 15 years or however old CrossFit is. I don't know. The way he labels it is it wasn't, so first of all, there's also an important need to separate CrossFit, the company from CrossFit, 
the style of training. Okay. CrossFit's a company. Yep. It's not a style of training. Right. Right. So CrossFit is a company conversations are, are different. Cro- CrossFit is a style of training. You walk into one CrossFit gym and you walk into another CrossFit gym, you're, you're not even remotely getting the same training. Very okay. likely. Right. Okay. Now, if you go to the CrossFit games, that's all very, very roughly standardized, right? Mm-hmm. But what one strength conditioning or one CrossFit gym does for their programming and what another one does, I mean, you're talking light years apart. So you're saying their method, their approach to getting high intensity, you know, their con- approach, con- constantly varied, whatever the definition is. Yeah, they're not even doing, a lot of them aren't even doing that, though. I mean, if you look around right now, the vast majority of CrossFit, I shouldn't say the vast majority, but a significant amount of CrossFit gyms, quote unquote, mm-hmm. are not at all doing anything that is related to CrossFit. They might do the open as a tribal strategy, let's get together or something. Right, right. But they're not doing CrossFit.com workouts. Okay. They're using kettlebells and they're doing pull-ups and they're doing circuit training, but they might be doing balance work in the middle of their wad. They yeah. might be getting high intervals some days. But hopefully, ideally, if you're doing high-intensity work every single day and you're with the general population, mm-hmm. you are getting broken for sure. That's what initially happened when CrossFit became popular is it was a misabuse of power, mm-hmm. and it was specifically a, an abuse of intensity. Okay. Because it's, it's, it's addicting. Yeah. You get results very quick. You physically feel good. I, having said that, though, I thoroughly believe a lot of people that run CrossFit gyms have evolved past that. Yeah. The sport is definitely... The sport, is, but, but, but the training as well, the training right, philosophy. Right, right, right. So I think a lot of the problems, they have improved because they recognized it, they saw it, and they're like, okay, now, again, the company... Mm-hmm. Not so much. The sport, absolutely not. It's gotten worse. They just add volume. Like, look what happens. Like, they're only going to continue to break people at the games. Right. But this is maximal competition. We don't complain about it in football. Mm-hmm. We don't complain about it in other sports. Right. So Very true. I, I have no issue with that. Um, my issue is saying, okay, if you're running your gym and you're just trying to design the nastiest wad you can every day mm-hmm. and some of your members are showing up four or five days a week, this is not good. Yeah, yeah. So we have to do that. So what Kenny does is has a more appropriate relationship with intensity. He he programs entirely different throughout his entire gym. It's not based on that. He he sets it up with his thing called the mastery method, mm-hmm. which is uh, just it's an entirely different approach to programming. It's not based on intensities and reps and volumes and things like that. It's based on outcome. Right. Which is different. So the difficulty of trying to categorize or label CrossFit mm-hmm. as good, bad, what is different because you have folks like Kenny that aren't even remotely close to doing what the CrossFit gym three miles down the road is doing. Right. I mean, they're not even the same universe. Right. They have the same piece of equipment, but not even close. It yeah. would be as different as if you walked into that CrossFit gym into an LA Fitness or a Bally's or a Velocity Sports. Right. It's that different. They just happen to share the same name. Yeah, which, like you said, is, is probably a good thing. No, right? it is. I mean, that's the model that they set up, right? Yeah. They mo- The reason why you can't sue CrossFit headquarters when you get hurt in CrossFit LA is because you're an independent business. Right. And they set it up that way. Right, right. So then we can't blame anyone else's CrossFit problems or successes on each other because we're all doing it entirely differently, and that's the way they set it up. Yeah, genius. Yeah, right? They want you to be like, give all the credit to CrossFit as a name when it works, but when there's blame, oh, 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 bro, you're doing your own stuff. You're not us. You just license our name. Right, right. So it's genius from their perspective. Uh, So one of the reasons that I I wanted to have you on Line Heart Radio in the first place was because I think you do a good job of finding that balance between the professor and the tactician Mm -hmm. because I think people all, typically they go really heavy on one way or the other. Um, a lot of times what's applicable in study, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you've never done it, if you've never sweated it out, you know, a lot of times it's sure. just not, it's not as applicable. And you mentioned the body of knowledge, which is a podcast that you have coming out. Yep. Why would people listen to that? Or, or So it? it's actually, you, you kind of gave the answer there. Um, so it, it, the body of knowledge was started by myself, Kenny Kane. Kenny is a longtime uh, former professional stand-up comedian. So touring, nice. like guy, yeah, like yeah. this is what he did. You name it, he's played with him. I mean, the biggest names in yep. comedy he's played with. But he also grew up. His mom and dad were both elected in the swimming hall of fame. Uh, so he's a lifetime athlete. He played a division one athlete himself, and he, like I said, he opened one of the first CrossFit gym. So he's a practitioner through and through. He's worked with celebrities, general population, a few CrossFit game athletes. Some of them you would recognize. Several winners have come to him. Okay. It's kind of like the guy behind the scenes no one's heard of. Okay, but if you're done well in CrossFit games, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I've talked to Kenny many yeah. times. And then a third guy, Josh Embry. And Josh has a PhD in uh, statistics and beha- human behavior. 
and we were just like, you know, one of the, we personally at this point in our career are not really interested anymore in the hacking. It's just not sustainable. I'm not interested in how do I boost my elevated testosterone or glutathione 3%, you know, like there's a place for it and I'm glad somebody does it. Yeah. I get it. I'm, I'm not trying to shame it. I'm just not interested in that in my career. Yeah. Anymore. Right now. They weren't either. And so we thought like, what if we took somebody who is a scientist whose job is to produce science all day and somebody whose job is to actually implement this stuff. And then mm -hmm. somebody who has a really good understanding of human behavior, which is what you need to understand to get people to do these things. Right. And what if we created a show where we all three look at common questions from our own perspectives. Mm hmm. And so the body knowledge is a little bit different. It's um, it's short. It's it's nine chapters, and we have a topic. It builds on each other, and we we honestly, it's it's like a mini documentary. Okay. We tell stories. Um, Are you gonna uh, release the whole season at once? Or? So sort of. Okay. We the April fourth, the first four episodes or first four chapters come out, and then a, a chapter will come out every week for the next five weeks. Okay. After that first week. And then we'll have a finale after that. Yep. And. Um, it's really at the intersection of science and fitness is what we're going for. So some of it will be very, very micro. We will get into the specific details of how many macros to have for this goal and, and protein grams and stuff like that. But then we'll also talk more importantly about what personal characteristics of yourself can you identify mm -hmm. that will let you understand which system of eating to go after. You know, like, so is there a lot of diet focus? No, that's oh. one of them. Oh, okay. And then another chapter is entirely different. And we talk about, we have a, um, a lady on whose job is to set up world and national healthcare systems. Mm. And so we say, okay, great, that's important. But how do we set up exercise practices that are sustainable and implementable across 300 million people? And then we have some where we take people whose jobs are to build celebrities. Uh, so we have Michael Blevins on, uh, on one of the chapters, and he talked about building... Um, Superman, the oh. Henry Cavill. Yep, yep. So he's the guy responsible for that and what it really takes to build a Superman. Mm. And you think you're going to hear a lot about, wow, this is his workout and his nutrition, and he covers that. Yeah. But it, it's way more than you think, and it's way different than what you think is coming. Okay. So we, my point is with all that is we range. Some of it's very, very micro supplements, and some of it is very large philosophical. Yeah. Uh, some of it is population-based, and, and it's kind of everywhere. So the chapters kind of build on each other. Yep. You can listen to them a little bit asynchronously if you'd like, but the theme really builds until a culmination at the end. So it's just a project where I'm like, let's. I wanted to take some of the stuff I do in class and some of the talks I've given professionally yeah. and put them together with Kenny. He does the same thing, and we can give people stuff that is inspiring, entertaining, educational, mm -hmm. that you're going to sit in your car and you're not going to want to turn your car off because you're like, I want to finish this episode. Yeah. And I'm late for a meeting, but I got to hear how this yeah, thing finishes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we're not trying to compete with you guys or Barbell Shrugged or any of the other guys. Uh, we just want to do these little short yeah. well, documentary series things um, that just because of, you know, they're fun to tell stories. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, the first thing that you mentioned was nutritional systems or, mm -hmm. or diet systems. And I think that one of the reasons that people – uh, get o get frustrated and don't do anything yeah. is because once you get involved and you want to take control of these things for yourself, like diet is a yeah. big one, uh, there's so many people selling you yep, something yep, else. Yep, yeah. And people are like, well, is paleo what's right? Sure, is sure. You know, ketogenic's gotten bigger lately. Yeah. Is ketogenic what's right? Um, so that's a, that's a very good example of... I, 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 am, I hate the noise. Uh -huh. I can't stand it. Okay. I, I, I have a hard time personally with selling anything. Um, it's not a good financial trait to have, <laughs> right. but, but I don't like it. I think and it's so, definitely an academic trait to have. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm a teacher. That's what I do. I want to give away. This is my, my website. I give all my uh, class lectures away on my website free. There's yeah. no upsell. There's no newsletter that you have mm -hmm. to click into. There is nothing you could do on your website that would ever even allow you to give me a dollar. It's all free. Okay. It always will be. Um, I just I want to get this stuff out there. I think that at this point in our... Uh, evolution as a species paying for knowledge is difficult and people don't want to do it and i don't think we have to should have to anymore mm -hmm. i think you should have to pay for experience your time if i want you to walk me through something that's your time and that's i can't make that up but i can make a video throw it up online that takes me three hours to make a five minute video yeah but then that five minute video can be played for infinity you don't need to pay me for that but i i wanted to tell these stories i wanted to teach these things because 
people get so frustrated. Like, I just wish someone would sell, me, give me this thing, and I feel really skeptical because you're trying to sell me something for sure. And so, I've also found in my class, if I just give you the answer to keto, or mm-hmm. give you the answer to which sup, how many grams of protein, yep, that's a question I have to then answer a hundred million times because everyone wants it, right? Right. right. The next person I have to answer it again, yep. and again, and again, and again. If I teach you how to think about the entire process, though, mm-hmm. you can then quickly answer this question at the snap of your own finger mm-hmm. because you know the system of thinking. And so that's what we did with the body knowledge is let's try to, div- to come up with common themes that give you the same answer Yeah, where you can plug and play. It's almost like we'll give you an algorithm to work off of. You plug in your three pieces and then boom, you automatically know, I guess for me, keto is not a good solution. Yeah, Or man, maybe it is paleo's better etc and so that's what our show focused on is really setting up those systems yeah. in a way that opex and james could understand and somebody who's they never ever worked out my mom could understand and goes hey i'm you know 56 i've never worked out mm-hmm. um I, I don't i'm not in this field at all i don't care about learning about atp like i don't really care about learning the grams per kilogram of like yeah. i just want to get started well we think we've developed a system that's plug and play for the beginning of most of those things. And that's a good thing about technology, like we were talking about in the yes. beginning, is you know giving people access to these things. Yeah, and then wh- where I think it's nice is, okay, you get started, you get going on that road, and yeah. now you get you want to try to optimize. Great, go to Ben Ben Greenfield. Mm-hmm. Go to Mike Bloodstuff. They'll tell you the final little tricks about yeah. you know peaking your thing, and those are cool, and, and I'll listen to them so I can do it myself. Yep. But we just wanted to take the other end of the spectrum and say, okay, like let's just help people get started, and let's think bigger and have bigger conversations it's about like some of right these topics. Wrong. Right. Because like, sure. there's right, wrong, this doesn't apply. Uh, always, never, these don't, suppl- these don't apply. But we also didn't want to be so philosophical that when you leave the episode, you're like, well, I still, really, still don't really know what to do. Because mm-hmm. that, that can happen yeah, when you start yeah, talking philosophy. Sure, you sure. get very vague, and you're like, yep. cool. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to do yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, we try to strike a balance between those things. Um, yeah. So on the on the topic of diet, did you catch the barbell shrugged with Doctor uh, Mike Nelson, T. Nelson? I know Mike very well. Oh, okay. I set him up. I'm I'm uh, the one that put him on the show. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Metabolic flexibility. Yeah. So I wanted to get I your. T- I handled those guys for like a year. I'm like, you got to get this dude on. Yeah. And then they finally were at Paleo FX, and I was like, I grabbed him and I grabbed Mike, and I'm like, you're shooting right now. Go. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I like about it is that it kind of took a lot of the dogma out of people's yeah. opinion about diet yeah but but i i am curious on w- what your opinion on i guess metabolic flexibility is so one of the issues i think um that i just i saw with it when i was watching it is i spent time well i spent time dallying and you know a Good. bunch of different diets yeah and i've i've done the ketogenic thing i actually had i like it for performance for me for ultra the most actually just okay right but what i found is those systems and I'm gonna. This is gonna be as lay as I can say this, just because I don't understand it fully. Sure. But um, I like those systems that, need to be upregulated. So, uh, for example, to make yourself fat adapted, it's not exi- it's not as easy as just eating fat and then okay, my <laughs> right. glycogen stores are gone. I'm fat adapted now. Right. Uh, at least that's what I found trying to test myself and get into ketosis. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm just curious about your opinion on what it takes to actually be metabolically flexible. Yeah. That's really good stuff, and I really like how you said that, by the way. A couple of things that you're not going to explain it well because you don't understand it well, which mm-hmm. is beautiful, right? Uh, we don't really understand something until we can explain it very simply. Right. 100%. Anyways, total feels so Yeah, I completely jump. agree, yeah. It's, it was great. Yep. More importantly, your question, metabolic flexibility. That's a very, very good concept. So that is an exact type of topic we cover in this show where if you understand what this means and you understand the answer to your question. So... For example, I'm not about to tell you keto is bad, Mm -hmm. but here's what I will tell you. If I gave you the blank statement that just said, hey, okay, I can put you on a diet that dramatically, and pick your number for dramatic, whatever dramatic means to you, 10%, 300, 3,000, whatever you want. Okay. I'll give you on a diet that dramatically increases your ability to burn fat. Yep. Is that a good thing? Uh, Off the top, yes. Okay. That's the problem. Okay. Right. If you dramatically burn more fat, increase your fat burning, Mm -hmm. what that means then is you dramatically reduce your ability to burn carbohydrate. Right. 
And that's not a good thing either. But if you're not using them. You're using them. Okay. Right. So that's the fundamental problem is it's the binary thinking that goes, wait a minute. I'll just burn more fat. I don't like having fat because it makes me look unsexy. Perfect solution. No. What we see time and time and time again is these diets can cripple your ability to use fat or use carbohydrate as a fuel. Okay. If you can't use carbohydrate as a fuel, you have lost all the underpinning mechanisms you need to start all of metabolism. So you're you're dead out of, out of the gates. And then if you do have to go do any carbohydrate reliant task, you're shot because you don't even have you've downregulated those enzymes. Those right. proteins are gone. You've they've gone through autophagy or they've been killed off in some other fast. They're they're out of, they're out of there. Okay. So having said that. Did I just tell you that ketogenic is useless? Not even close. Right. Metabolic flexibility in particular is an example of saying you need to have the ability to do both. Mm -hmm. And what Mike, I think, would grant you, and I would as well, mm -hmm. a lot of people are shifted towards the carbohydrate. So why a lot of people respond well to the first time they attempt keto is because they are shifted so far to one end of the spectrum, it actually puts them more towards the middle. But they're falsely thinking going to the far end, fat only, is the weird place to go, mm -hmm. which is not the place to go. Metabolic flexibility says I should be able to use both of them equally efficiently. Okay. Now, sometimes that means I have to dramatically reduce one for a short time because I'm too far down my spectrum. It's exactly like we talked about earlier with the strength versus conditioning spectrum. Mm -hmm. Right. You're trying to optimize both. Metabolic flexibility is very similar to... Physiological flexibility. I should be strong and fit and have a great cardiovascular endurance and have a high heart rate and be able to repeat multiple bouts of high force, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you then need to go through a short bout of ketogenic or it doesn't even matter if it's ketogenic, it could be a low carbohydrate training phase or whatever, a bunch of ways you could get to this because you are actually very, very, very poor at burning fat, then that's probably beneficial. But the goal then would be to be land back in the middle of that spectrum. Mm hmm not to stay at the very end of that other end because that's not a good place to be either. Either end performance. is essentially an issue. Yeah, and I would I would grant you that most people are probably hedged towards over relying on carbohydrate. Right. Well, there's sugar and everything. Right. Well, it's carbohydrates is much more available. Right. Right. So I mean, sugar independent, it's yeah. just much more available. Right, it's cheaper. Right. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we we tend to have a hankering for it, but we don't. And you could look. We actually just published a um, a point counterpoint on ketogenic diet. Oh, okay. Uh, in the Strength and Conditioning Journal. Where's that? Where can people find that? Uh, if you just Google the Strength and Conditioning Journal, okay. it's uh, online. It's through the NSCA, the okay. National Strength and Conditioning Association. Right. If you're a member, you get it for free. But you could probably honestly find it on ResearchGate. Okay. So if you go to that website, ResearchGate. Um, I think, actually, Mike wrote one of the columns for that. Okay. Funny enough. Uh, nice. And there's it's a short. It, it's very layman friendly. Mm hmm um, here's the pro, here are the cons of it. Yep. I think he did anyways. Um, do you think a cyclic ketogenic diet is a way to stay in the middle? An effective way to stay in the middle? It can, but I don't think you need to. Okay. I don't think you need to at all. I think it, which is different than saying, can it work? Right. Can it work doesn't mean you should. So if somebody tried it, I wouldn't say, look, it's helping me stay in the middle. I would believe them. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's something you have to do to stay in the middle. Okay. Uh, I don't think people are nearly as carbohydrate aligned as people think. Mm -hmm. Some can. Um, but we're probably not there. What tends to happen is people going like, oh, yeah, I'm ch I'm a little bit. I got that extra three or four or five pounds going on there. Yep. I'm too carbohydrate. I got to get burning fat better. Right. Bullshit. It's like, <laughs> you just want to stop eating carbs because you think that's going to make you skinnier. Yeah. Like, that's well, just, what that's is not it? What good. are people's, what is the answer there then? To what? Uh, to those people that are like, okay, I, I'm carrying just a, co a little bit extra. Seems it's probably like just straight calories. Yeah. It's probably a straight calorie issue. You're eating too many calories. Mm. There is another good example of something we would cover in the nutrition episode. What's more important? Uh, if we're talking about somebody who wants to lose fat, mm -hmm. okay, because the answer of mo most important is always determined by goal. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody wants to lose fat, whether it's three pounds or 300 pounds or 30 pounds, doesn't matter. They want to lose fat. That's their primary nutrition goal right now. Yep. What's more important, quantity or quality? Quality. It's quantity. You think? I, I don't think. Well, I know. Yeah, you know. But. It, it, like it's, it's not even close. But your gut reaction was right there because here's the big difference. If, I have, if I'm eating a horrible diet, mm -hmm. it is much more effective, much more sustainable, 
and it's a better long-term practice to go, look, fuck, dude, fuck calories. Let's just get you eating better food. That is a far better approach, short-term and long-term. But it still does come down to a calorie issue. You, you can't avoid that issue. Uh, and, and there's no insulin fairy, right? There's, no, there's none of these magical things like where the difference is calorie absorbed is different than calorie consumed because your body's not a perfect system. So if I consume 200 calories yep. of fat or lard and I consume 200 calories of carrot, 200 calories is 200 calories going in. But the way that I absorb those 200 calories is different. So I might absorb... 195 of the 200 of the lard. I might only absorb 120 of the 125 of the carrot, though. Yeah. The rest is lost in fiber. Okay. Right. Right? So people, again, with this argument, they talk past each other. They're not listening. They're not really trying to understand. They're listening so that they can respond, not so that they understand. What we're really saying is I am not telling you that if you said 200 calories of McDonald's and 200 calories of vegetables is going to equal the same weight loss, the vegetable would win. But if you equate them for total calories absorbed in the stomach, then it's going to be equal. Okay, That's the different conversation people aren't having. Mm-hmm. And that's where it gets really tricky because how the hell are you going to figure out how much is actually absorbed? Well, you can use fiber as a good estimate because that can be scratched out for other things, but right. it's very, very difficult. So answering the question of quality of quantity, for most people, Vast majority of the time, just focus on quality. Quality. Yeah. Quality food, quality food. But say you've, you've gone, and I've had many clients, many, many clients do this. Uh, you go quality first. That's all you focus on for six months, yep. a year. And you lose that first 20 pounds. That's good. That's what, that's what I do, right? But now you're stuck. And you've got 15 more to lose. And you haven't lost a pound in six months. You're already eating super high quality food. Mm-hmm. That is a quantity issue. Now it's a yeah. It's a now you have to just come down in the amount you're eating. Like yep. period. And so, it really is a quantity issue, in terms of that's the honest answer. But in terms of human behavior, in terms of practice sustainability, then let's say usually we want to start with quality, but eventually we're gonna have to come to quantity. So it depends on where you're at in the process. And the problem is, I think when you are when you don't have an extensive background in in yeah. physiology in physiology physi- physiology physiology yeah. or these things, the problem is you want to look at things in a it's a you you want to try to understand them, so you want to try to make them binary. You want to yeah. try to make them yes totally. no. You know, I think that's the problem that people run into with this argument and any other. Yeah. Argument. So and that, that's a very good point. Uh, the way that I like to address that is saying, okay, I get it. Because I, I do the same thing. Like if you if this was a conversation about accounting, mm-hmm. like I am now you in terms of like I don't I don't care. I don't want to know the systems. I don't want to know about like growth. Like I don't want equations. Just like tell me where to put my money. Done. Right. Like, if it's accounting, we're both me. Right. But whatever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Finance. I mean, auto. Like yeah. you, you pick it. Right. Anything right. outside of this space, I do the same thing. Right. So we're all like that. I'm not. Yeah. Right. Okay. I want just a straight answer. So if you're like I don't want a just straight answer, I get it. Yeah. My advice to you is this then. Just go for your straight answer. Mm-hmm. But always keep in your mind that's not an actual truth. That is a suggestion. And I'm going to go with that suggestion for now. But I will recognize if it's not working, maybe I need to search for a different answer. So that's my recommendation for those folks is just don't accept it as infallible truth. Yeah. And then you'll be fine. So whatever CrossFit tells you, whatever your person, like, okay, good suggestion. All right, he's telling me to do this. He's telling me to cut carbs. I'm going to cut carbs. Cool. Yeah. But if something comes up later or somebody else tells me cutting carbs is bullshit, don't go like, no, 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 dude, no, no. CrossFit says it is. It is truth. As long as you stay away from that conversation, you're fine. That's a problem CrossFitters particularly, I think, fall oh, into. Hugely. Is that they're like, I'm my way of fitness is correct. Yeah. Right. Massive. That's right. like one of the things we talked about earlier. I'm like, that's my issue with it. It's more of the culture and the people than it is the, the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but, you know, let's also be fair to CrossFit. They're not the only subculture or tribe that does that. Right. I mean, Very true. NFL fans are the same way. Like, yeah, well, you, you pick the that's same true. thing, right? Yeah, so it's, it's not blame them. We right, all right. have that same thing. But yeah. that's just one thing that culture could improve on is saying, uh, you know what? Maybe um, there are more things to physical fitness and health than kettlebells yeah. and pull ups. Well, and I think that even the people that are really at the forefront of the sport side of CrossFit are realizing that and their methods are evolving. Yeah. I had a great conversation a long time ago with a good friend of mine, Alex. Um, Alex Martinez, he sells. Uh, He's a lifelong fitness guy. He's always around paleo effects. He's 
his uh, Instagram or his social media is uh, so wrong fitness. Nice. Fucking hilarious. Yeah. It's so, he's <laughs> so funny. He's super good. But we always talk about this. Exercise equipment is a great example. Like if you ask a CrossFitter what they think about a leg press machine, like you would get an unending pile of dog shit. Yeah. We are the machine. Which is so short-sighted. It's foolish and short-sighted. There are umpteen positive adaptations you could get from a leg press. Mm -hmm. Why that happens is because, again, they're not thinking very big. They're thinking super small. This is my answer. This is what I've been programmed to be to said, and I'm true. If we start to put examples out there, though, we can find tons of solutions in which a leg press is not very good, and I can find you tons of solution or examples in which it's an excellent choice. I get off, literally off the top of my head. One quick example. If you try to say what is a better, if you had one exercise to choose the rest of your life, for most average people, okay, a squat, a, free, a barbell squat's probably better. Okay, mm -hmm. deadlift. What, what, well, if you just if you just had to pick between squat and leg press. Okay. Sorry. Bad. Oh right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm picking squat. Okay. Yeah. Duh. Right. And if that's the conversation, cool conversation over. I'm, I'm probably not interested in having a further conversation about that because I, I think that's generally going to be a a wide sweeping answer. Okay. If you say, though, something like, well, what about a client that comes in and, um, boy, got no cartilage in their knee? Uh, we'll have them box squat. Oh, that hurts, too. Oh, we'll have them do that. Uh, why not leg press them? Why? If they can do and they, all of a sudden they get leg press and they go, man, they got good positions. Spine is neutral. They're getting great depth. Feet are flat on the floor. Good positions forward. And they're like, man, I can press. I feel a really good contraction of my glute and hamstring. Yeah. Cool. So you're trying to tell me not working the glute and hamstring is a better choice than working on that machine. Bullshit. Like, no way. Yeah. Why? Why it's so problem? Well, we're going to try to find other ways to do it. And you spend years and years toiling around with different types of squats on boxes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why not just use the squat or the, 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 the leg press? Yeah. So your argument is you can achieve the same adaptation without not the same. scaling the... Not the same. Okay. It wouldn't be the same. I mean, well, nothing's okay. the same, right? Yeah. If it's different, it's different, period. Mm -hmm. Uh, a front squat, a front squat is different than a goblet squat. Period. It's maybe eighty percent the same, or eighty-five, or ninety, yeah, or whatever, seventy yeah, percent. Right. So would it be the exact same squat? No. And that's the conversation that gets failed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, and no one, Alex would. It's not the same exercise, but it can be similar. So just because it's not the same exercise, or it's not generally as effective, does not mean it is totally ineffective. That's the problem. Would I have five leg press machines in my gym? Probably not. Would I buy one? Maybe not. But if I have one laying around or I find one at a, at a garage sale one day or something and I can grab it for a great deal and it works well yeah. and I got space, would it be my first priority? No. I'm not putting a leg press in before I'm putting a squat rack in. No, but if I have 12 squat racks, do I need a 13th? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe one leg press is pretty good. There are other things I can get with it that I – that. It's probably a good use. And yeah. that's just one example, and I picked that one because I know that's one that would be very inflammatory, right? And just to show you how if we think bigger and think better, we start to lose grasp of like, well, I'll never do this. This is stupid. This is awful. The bench press is another example. The mm -hmm. bicep curl is another example. You don't think a bicep is functional? Oh, really? Okay, so your body mm -hmm. evolved to have a muscle that doesn't do anything. Right. And they put it on your arm where the thing that moves in front of your face, right, yeah, that's right. not functional. Right, right. I'm not saying doing preacher curls all day is what you do to improve health, but let's not fool ourselves and say a bicep's not functional. Get the fuck out of here. I have a problem with that argument, too. I mean, strength is functional. Endurance is functional. Um, right. So if, the, the so elbow extension's cool, but elbow flexion, un, like, <laughs> not into get, it. get out of here. <laughs> right, right. So the final, uh, I guess, thing I want to talk about real quick is usually the final question is about advice, but I think we've probably given out so much advice. Okay. So... Um, so I know that you spend a lot of time on the forefront of research, um, as, as far as physiology is concerned or, or, uh, exercise physiology is concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what right now are, are you most excited about with research and, and with what you're finding? Uh, you know, a lot of stuff that we're going down. Um, my Irene, Irene, uh, Tobias, my postdoc, who is probably standing outside of our door right now waiting. Okay. That's all right. Uh, Sorry. she'll be here in a second. Okay. Uh, she's doing a lot of stuff right now on a couple of signaling proteins that are really cool. So these are molecules within your muscle fibers. And the one that she's looking at is the one that controls energy regulation. And it's called AMPK. Okay. And and where that really is, is thing is that's the molecule that is supposed to block 
the molecule that turns on muscle growth. So you're, you're familiar with what's called the interference effect, right? So if I do a bunch of aerobic exercise, it's going to block my muscle growth. Sure. Right? Yep. Well, there's a particular protein that's responsible for that. AMPK is the one that blocks the muscle growth part. Okay. So we're doing a lot of work in that area because and CrossFit is a great example saying, maybe that's not so true. Yeah. Like pretty clearly. Yeah, that paradigm's being shattered. Right. So we're looking at that protein right now um, and we're doing it. What's really cool is we're doing it in, in men and in women. Very cool. Which is really, really cool. Mm-hmm. So we're really excited about that. She's She ran some of the things this morning. Because the downstream substrate of that protein is uh, is the molecule behind the window of gains, mm-hmm. right? The post-exercise anabolic window. Yep. So we have a beat on that one as well. Very cool. And individual muscle fibers. Uh, we're also, the American Open, December 7th, is here in Anaheim, which is down the road. So we're trying to get funding right now to do biopsies of all the people at the American Open. You need to get funding and waivers. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not a problem. You know, we'll get enough. Um, but the reason is you, we've actually never studied muscle of a, a high level or even moderately high level strength, speed, or power athlete. Really? It's just mostly college. It's all college pop. or it's all endurance athletes, steady state endurance. Okay. Very cool. And so we want to know, I mean, even something basic like fiber type. Yeah. We would assume you'd think, well, these guys all have fast twitch. Oh, it's actually never been studied. Interesting. Don't know. Yeah. So we got that. If funding comes around, we'll do that December 7th. And then um, the other project that I wanted to mention that we're doing is, uh, of course, the epigenetic study. So epigenetics is this idea that you're born with a certain set of genes, Mm -hmm. right? Your mom and dad, half and half. But the way that those genes are expressed Mm -hmm. changes based on your lifestyle. Turned on or off. Right. Right. And so we we, we just completed the first ever trial looking at how acute strength training, uh, leg presses, by the way, um, a bunch of other squatting and stuff. Yeah. Doing that, how that changes, which genes are turned on, which ones are turned off, which ones are upregulated and downregulated, mm-hmm. and then how that differs in people who are very, very strength trained versus people who are sedentary. So we literally last week we finished that. We're working on the, the tissue analysis right now. So all that stuff's coming. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Have you read the sports gene? Yeah, of course. Okay, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, for people that are listening and uh, are intrigued by, by the things that you said or want to follow along or support your journey, um, I know we mentioned your book, and I know we mentioned... Uh, yeah, the book, Unplugged, is on Amazon right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll link that up in yeah, the show notes. Yeah, that'll be available for... It'll come out July 11th, but it's up. Uh, and then it'll probably be in your bookstores, in right. your local bookstores. Um, thebodyofknowledge.com. Okay. Uh, and then on Instagram, uh, at thebodyofknowledge is, is the, the new show. Mm-hmm. And then my personal stuff, uh, my website where I have all those lectures in my classes, yep. it's just my name, andygalpin.com. Um, and then I'm at Dr. Dr. So just Dr. Andy Galpin on Twitter and Instagram. So Perfect. Well, thanks for being on, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, man. All it's right. fun. Thanks, brother. Yep. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. Subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating. For all of your supplement needs and for show notes, visit louavive.com.